Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another episode of the Daily Friends Show. I'm your host, Nicholas Lorimer, and today I'm joined by Mr. Marius Ruet, who is a bit ill. So thank you, Marius, for joining us on this day. How's it, guys? I'm, I'm on the road to recovery, let you know. Excellent, excellent. Mm. Uh, and we also have uh, Mr. Terence Corrigan. Terence, how are you doing, sir? A little bit chilly today, isn't it? It is, but I must say it's refreshing after those uh, very hot days. And uh, as a fat man who doesn't enjoy summer, I very much appreciate these rainy days in Joburg. But um, yes, I, I hope that my sound is a little bit better than it's been the past couple of days. Uh, I have finally moved into my new place. So hopefully my sound should only improve from here as I set up more and more of my recording area. But let us get into our first uh, story of today. Now, I, I think there is a bit of a slow news day today because uh, News24 had a headline story of what to do about a beached seal. So uh, <laughs> I think there's not a huge amount to report on in the news. Uh, but let's start off with some comments made by uh, ANC, uh, uh, sorry, uh, Tourism Minister Lindiwe Susulu, who was giving an interview to the SABC News this week on issues affecting the ANC in the country. Uh, she's going to be competing for ANC, the position of ANC president at the elective conference at the end of the year. But I have a feeling that her campaign is not going very well because during this interview with the SABC, she claimed that the thing that gets you ahead in the ANC is the size of your purse. She cast some skepticism on the nominations for President Cyril Ramaphosa's um, uh, uh, bid for leadership, uh, another term as leader of the ANC, saying, quote, I hope these are there are these are not people who are given money to vote in a particular way. That is something in this conference that we're going to need to take a resolution on. How do we fund people who are standing? Uh, she went on to say that those in the ANC who have quote a bigger purse have a bigger opportunity of ascending. So, Morris, let me start with you on this one. Um, what's striking to me about this is I think it really speaks to how awful this is uh, how awful things are inside the ANC this is a fairly senior leader of the of the party she's um uh, she she you know I, she's i think got not a chance in hell of winning <laughs> the leadership conference at the end of the year and yet here she is attacking the party publicly and saying that essentially everyone just bribes their way into top positions um not good for them what do you make of all this i think Lindiva Sisulu herself is sort of a microcosm of the whole ANC She's kind of made a, you know, she's she's increasingly looking foolish. And uh, while she's running for president of the ANC, she's done some really weird things. I don't know if people watching will remember, uh, I don't know if it was a year or two ago, uh, there was some MK veterans uh, meeting and guys were in their uniforms and she arrived there also in a, a you know, a army camouflage, but wearing high heels and did a parade inspection of these guys. And also now just a month or two ago, some footage came out of her sweeping the driveway, whatever it was, at a ministerial residence. But while she was wearing a tight dress and high heels and stockings, like, you know, I'm uh, I'm pretty sure that any any woman who does any sweeping is not going to do it while she's wearing high heels. So it's also just so obvious. It's just doing it as a photo op or whatever, or, you know, a video op, I suppose. It's just ridiculous. But yeah, and also, on the, I mean, just to also remember that she was uh, still around with Pauses running mate in 2017. So it also shows you there's no real principles uh, in the party, but uh, speaking of Lindy was Sulu being Solar Ramaphosa's running mate, and of course it's like Mini Zuma ran against Solar Ramaphosa and was Zuma and Jacob Zuma's uh, kind of proxy candidate in 2017, 10 years before that, she'd been Tabo Mbeki's running mate when he ran against Jacob Zuma himself. So it also shows you that, you know, a lot, there's no real principles behind any of this kind of stuff. You know, maybe it was different in the 90s. I think it probably was slightly different in the 90s with NC, but then I think in a way, it, Maybe the party is actually more united, even uh, ideologically speaking, than it is now. But yeah, I think it is just kind of my cousin of the ANC. The you know, there's no real unification, um, anything holding the party together except for patronage, and uh, you know, the for being in power. So yeah, uh, it's it does not really surprise me. It also shows you what mess the ANC is in, and also I think shows you that you Sisulu is not Sisulu is not a fit person to either be in the leadership of the ANC or to be a government minister, to be honest. And, you know, if her surname wasn't Sisulu, uh, I'd, I'd actually question how far she would be in the party. No, yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> I think many people have pointed that out. Uh, also, of the two Sisulu kids, uh, I think her brother is by far the more talented. And, and he was actually a pretty good speaker. He actually took his duty seriously yeah. and was impartial when he was speaking, gave opposition parties 
you know, fair, fair time to speak and so on. Lindy was Sicily is obviously, I mean, she's just, a, I don't know, you know, <laughs> I don't know what she is. So Terence, uh, I think, you know, what she says here is almost at least a little bit true, that uh, the role of money plays a very big part in ANC's internal elective conferences. That would explain how, for example, during, um, there was some polling done of the ANC's members in the lead up to the the contest between Kosasana Tlumini Zuma and uh, Soro Maposa. And it found that pretty much everywhere, rank and file, ANC members were firmly behind Romaposa. And yet when the votes came in, it was a pretty closely cut thing. And that's because I suspect the delegate system has been so sort of hijacked by special interest groups and party bureaucrats and money. Um, and I suspect that this is really ultimately one of the reasons why the ANC has so much uh, difficulty in reforming, even when it faces the prospect of electoral oblivion. Um, what are your thoughts on this? Well, go you know go back uh, last last few conferences. Um, they started to have this like special area. I think in one stage it was called the Lizard Lounge, where you know business grandees could come and mingle and smoke expensive cigars and cut deals. Um, yeah, look, uh, and 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 in the ANC's defence, partially, um, you know, uh, 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 business and moneyed interests in this country have been uh, happy to happy to play this game. You know, you need it, it. It it takes two to tango, and certainly, um, they were uh, they, they were partners in the dance. Um, look, I, I I think I I think the you know she she embodies another another tradition that Ms. Morris alluded to, a famous name. Uh, you know, called call, uh, if 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 some people are able to buy their way in, I think some people are able to 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 maintain their career on the back of an illustrious parentage. You know, sort of aristocracy. This is French, you know, French Revolution bourgeoisie versus you know first estate. Um, see, I, I I I learned I learned something in history in history one hundred and one, um, and uh, just on the um, uh, on the question of uniform back in back in two thousand and eleven. Um, the Freedom Day celebrations. She caused quite a stir by uh, by attending cele uh, celebrations, wearing what looked like a like a navy uniform with braid and everything, and turned this into some sort of cosplay thing. Um, and uh, the Freedom Front Plus was very upset about this and was politicizing the uniform. And her spokesman said, "No, no, no. This is just a ceremonial uniform. If you look at it, there's no rank or anything." So, yeah, I mean, it was like this. Uh, I don't know. It's it, it almost like. Someone pretending to be a to be uh, to be a naval general or whatever, and you know, pretending to be pretending to be a minister. And what do they say about um, about a government? It's a bit like Hollywood. Everyone has an acting position. There you go. <laughs> yes, I think I think as Mario said, this is it's kind of in microcosm. What's wrong with the uh, with the ANC at large? But, uh, anyway. you, uh, just to uh, say also with the army uniform, any politician who. You know, kind of cosplayers as an army person normally comes to a kind of a sticky end. If you remember Michael Dukakis in the 1988 US presidential election, uh, where, because people said he was soft on, uh, he'd be soft on Soviet Union, went and, he rode a tank. Out, yeah, and drove a tank and looked pretty foolish because he's quite a small guy sticking out of this tank. George Bush also, or George W. Bush also famously, because he, uh, he was actually a fighter pilot back in the day. He actually flew a plane, landed on an aircraft carrier, and Big banner behind him after the, at the end of the Iraq war saying mission accomplished and this was about 12 years before america actually did pull out of iraq <laughs> so and also let's not forget sort of Ramaphosa himself uh, was wearing a, a uniform just before uh, covid lockdown so yeah it's just all a bit strange indeed indeed all right let's move on to something uh, a, a little bit more amusing um and a little well i mean <laughs> I would I would find this more amusing if uh, Lindu Sisulu wasn't a minister. <laughs> but anyway, um, so our next story, we're going to just talk very briefly about uh, Elon Musk's acquisition of Twitter. Now, as I'm sure everyone is aware, um, who's watched the show a long time, uh, Musk uh, uh, announced that he was going to be buying Twitter a while ago. Then he sort of tried to go back on the deal. And then there was a lot of toing and froing, and eventually, um, before the thing went to court, he went through with the deal and purchased Twitter. So he's now the owner, along with a, a group of, of financiers, but the company is now private. He's apparently um, fired a lot of the, the senior management and is looking to really shake things up at the company. So I think uh, it's going to be interesting to see what he does with it. But 
one of the strange things that's come out is, and you know, Musk is a little bit of a, I don't know what to say, prankster, trickster. Um, <laughs> you can't always know for sure whether he's doing something seriously. He initially announced something along the lines of, um, on Twitter, you have this thing where you are, uh, and, and can I just say about Twitter that it's not actually one of the biggest social media networks. Uh, every A lot of the other ones, Instagram, Facebook, these other ones are much bigger. The difference is Twitter uh, has lots of pol politicians and journalists and brands in particular on the platform, and this is where its strength lies. Um, Musk, uh, so, so on Twitter, if you're a famous enough account, you get a little check mark next to your name, which says that you are this person for real, and this is not a fake or a spoof or a parody or anything like that, or you actually are this brand so that you know, you can't have someone who creates the account name KFC and then runs around uh, pretending to be KFC, but is actually not. Uh, Musk has said that he was he's thinking of charging around, initially it was $20 a month was the rumor um, for this blue check mark, but now it's $8 a month. Uh, and he tweeted, power to the people, blue check mark for $8 a month. Uh, and this would see you pay a certain amount every month, which is I think around 150 Rand to get the blue check mark that signals you are a verified authenticated account. You would the also get priority. Yes, priority replacements, uh, mentions and search. And what he said, this would also help to defeat spam and scam messages on the platform. Um, so the rationale I've heard for this is that the target really here is is big companies that use Twitter as advertising. Essentially, you've been able, if you're a company, to create a free Twitter account, get yourself verified at no real cost, and then tweet out links to your publications or to special offers or engage with your customers. And the idea here is to make those companies pay for using that service, but it will also affect ordinary people as well. Um, who aren't necessarily brand owners. But, uh, Morris, you uh, you have a strange feeling about this, don't you? I think he's trolling. I don't think he's, this is for real. And you can just see the replies, you know. So, at first, he was saying it was $20. And then Stephen King tweeted saying, there's no way he's going to pay $20 to be verified. So, Elon Musk replied to him and said, sorry, Mr. King, would $8 be all right? You know, so I'm pretty sure he's trolling. And we know Elon Musk is basically a troll. Uh, when he when he first came into Twitter headquarters, I don't know if anybody watching this saw this. So he like this was the morning he bought the company. He walked in holding a sink because he's bought Twitter and let that sink in. So it's it's like the, the guys at twelve. I'm pretty sure he's not. You know this isn't for real. And apparently, even if uh, every verified account on Twitter had to pay twenty dollars or whatever it is, it would be equivalent to about one day's uh, advertising revenue that Twitter currently makes. Uh, you know, one day out of the year. So it's, it'll be a splash in the ocean. It's not really, I think he's just doing this to wind up people who are very, really very far and are getting upset now. People like Stephen King and other people said, oh no, if they can't be very far, they're leaving and all this kind of stuff. So I'm pretty sure nothing's going to happen with this. And people, you know, I think, you know, he's just uh, went and laid the trap. And I think Elon Musk is probably just, you know, laughing, you know, laugh, uh, having a good giggle over this whole thing and seeing how people are using their minds, to be honest. And also just on another note, Elon Musk seems to be this kind of lightning rod for people's feelings. Like, I mean, I think there's a lot to criticize him for, but he's definitely not this kind of alt-right, you know, basically Nazi guy who's, you know, going to let people say all kinds of crazy things. And, and you know, like Elon Musk, any person like who's got, he's a really big ideas guy. He is changing the world. And anybody who changes the world or has these really big ideas, anybody who has done something that kind of echoes through history, whether good or bad, I mean, even if it's good, are generally, you know, they, they are often unpleasant people because they have to be really driven. They have to often not care about other people. And I think, you know, it's probably not a stretch to say if we do get to Mars in the next 30, 40 years, you know, Musk is going to play a big part of that. And I'm, I'm a bit of a believer when it comes to this thing. I mean, I might see humans on Mars in the next 20 or 30 years. Uh, but yeah, but if, if it does happen, I think uh, Elon Musk will be playing a very important role in that. So Terence, uh, you're someone who's famously said that Twitter is a pox and a plague. Um, what was very amusing to me was seeing people, you know, some of the world's most uh, influential journalists and, and such tweeting on these platforms, we must stay strong in this dark time and hold on to the platform lest Elon Musk drive us off or charge us for free speech. Uh, sorry, it's I just want to I saw one guy say we must be like the Ukrainians and stand strong. Like, yeah, come on, it's, 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 you're not farting. Oh, come on. Yeah, no, there's 
it's an embarrassing spectacle. What's what's your take on this as, as, as someone who's an outsider from the social media mess? Well, look, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm very proud to say I am not on Twitter, have never been on Twitter and not ever intend to be on Twitter. Just, you know, um, look, my, 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 my view on the one hand is complete and utter indifference. Um, I, you know, I, I I don't think it's a medium that that actually allows you to, to 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 communicate effectively. I think it debases public debate. But yeah, look, okay, people um, uh, uh, people like it. I think I think there is an interesting um, there is an interesting dimension about this this kind of digital town square and whether whether there is some sort of responsibility, even if it's just a moral responsibility on um, uh, on private interests that control these things to make sure that they are as widely accessible as possible. Um, but yeah, you know, I think. But I, you know, I think even the, even that sort of um, uh, real, I think that 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 is a very serious question. Um, is debased and just and 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 turned into some sort of digital clown show when people, are, you know, are, are are comparing this to 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 Ukraine or um, you know. Uh, you know, this is this is like you know bitching because you, because you lost your favorite brand of um, uh, a brand of, of of frozen yogurt, and you know comparing it to the killing fields in Cambodia or something like that. These things are not. <laughs> really, uh, oh, no. <laughs> uh, you know, the, it, it's it's the, there's the there's a there's a certain trivialization that um, uh, that, that 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 I think comes with um, uh, comes with the society being as comfortable as we are, at least by historical standards. Um, you know, I was, I was, I was actually speaking to somebody earlier, early, earlier today. And I said, you know, we, 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 we complain about our lives and I'm as guilty as this as anyone, but you know, the standard of living we have is probably better than 99.9% .9 of people in human history. Um, you know, they, they were, you know, emperors of medieval Mali that had these columns of slave old slaves holding gold gold staffs to pay for their pilgrimage to Mecca. You know, who didn't have running water in their you know in their, in, in, um, uh, in their palaces. I, I I just think sometimes a little bit of perspective is a good thing. Top tip from Terence: perspective, good thing. I think that's completely correct. Okay, let's move on to our next topic. Uh, this is about etols, which have been much derided. By many, um, there are some arguments to be made for paying a tolling system uh, to pay for roads. So, because the, the the idea here is that the the people actually using the product are the ones who end up paying for it, rather than it being uh, pushed off onto the taxpayer. Um, which is why the unions opposed it because they said, oh, it's the privatization of roads. Um, but many other people opposed it because they said this is too expensive. It's going to make Harting's highways. Um, uh, you know, unaffordable, it's going to raise the cost of living and it's just generally going to result in more money being wasted on very expensive tenders and contracts rather than actually going to the infrastructure because I remember, I can't remember the exact details, but I know that the company that got the eToll's contract originally was going to take a significantly large cut of the revenue collected. Well, uh, as a result of this, it was very successfully boycotted by citizens and civil society. Um, uh, I remember, I think it was a year ago, something like only 20% of people who passed through eToll systems actually paid the tolls. And government was just, quite frankly, not able to cope with the enormous boycott uh, of, of the system. And so it looks like, finally, the government is, is beginning to actually take some concrete steps on giving up on eTolls. Rather than us just sitting in this limbo, um, National Treasury says that it's going to be financing 70% of Sanrail, which is the uh, South African National Roads Agency's outstanding debt, and 30% is going to be coming out of the housing provincial budget. And there's now talk that eTolls will not too far from now be scrapped entirely. Uh, this caused some people, including former Finance Minister Tito Mboweni, who is still in the public life because of Twitter. Um, saying that, quote, I have been a law-abiding citizen paying e-tolls. So this, in this situation, do I get a refund? Otherwise, I'm going to court for my refund. Simple. Marius, what do you make of the call for refunds for those who did pay their e-tolls? Sorry for you, I think. If you, uh, <laughs> that's too bad. And I don't think you'd have much of a 
leg to stand on courts, I'm pretty sure. And, you know, and then, it, yeah, it's also a bit of a weird thing. You want to help pay for these things now, and you I mean, cause a big problem for the government. So I don't see it happening. Uh, just as an aside, uh, a friend of mine, he sometimes watches the show, uh, so Kevin, if you're listening, this is about you. His father-in-law for Christmas a few years ago bought him an e-tech, which I thought was quite funny. But, <laughs> but yeah, I think, it's, I mean, it's also one funny thing that the ANC did as well. They, when they said ETOLs are getting scrapped, uh, they said, ain't see how ten is scrapped ETOLs, blah, blah, blah. And it's just like, it was all yeah, over every, Twitter as well. Before and, every election, we've had a version of that story. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, but the ANC is also very good at this. ANC upset at whatever, blackout, or ANC accept, uh, uh, upset at high crime rates, marching to uh, marching on the ANC at the Tuli House on Friday, or whatever the case is. So it's all quite funny. You wouldn't swear the ANC has been a powerful media generation, but anyway. <laughs> Terence, um, I think, you know, regardless of whether ETOLs are formally scrapped or not anytime soon, uh, I think it's fairly clear that the system has failed. And mm. I really think that this kind of shows the the dangers of trying to tax people too much, um, particularly when the method of, of, of not paying is, is pretty easy, which is that you just don't pay. Um, as long as you don't get that e-tag, you're safe. Um, yeah. What do you make of the whole saga? Look, I I, um, I think that the, there's an interesting little caveat to all of this, and that and and that is that the 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 launch of the project does not appear to have been motivated by some sort of corruption. Um, I remember listening to 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 Wayne Duvernage once, and he was asked, "Well, you know, like," and I, I mean, I, I'd heard rumors well, about when, how the when Duvernage of uh, of Alta, yeah, who, yeah who in many ways made the protests against yeah, him. and I, I I'd heard at one point that uh, you know like the Guptas were involved. And he said, look, we tried to find some sort of connection to some sort of network, but we couldn't. So actually, this seems to have been, as, you know, within its own frame of reference, fairly above, uh, above board. Um, I, I think that what, 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 we, what, we, what we saw in it was um, government introduced this and then ran for the hills and kind of left, uh, what was his name, Nazir Ali, to, you know, a, a civil servant to... to uh, uh, to face the music and i must say i had some sympathy for him um he he should not have been uh, uh been the person expected to provide uh to provide leadership but yes i think that um if you if if, if you add up just how sick and tired south africans have become about corruption wastage and um it's generally the the decline of the decline of the country since um I traced this around right, right about to the to the financial, global financial crisis. We took a big hit. A lot of people lost their jobs. We never really recovered. Um, Etols was one thing that they could actually get at. Um, I remember Kasatu organized a big march, and it was interesting how they tried to like you know portmanteau issues. So it was a march against Etols and labor brokers. Two issues which. <laughs> This is one um, of my favorite uh, things. Uh, I don't know if you saw uh, the big union uh, strike that was was planned for a while ago. Um, it, was, it was a few weeks ago, and it was supposed to be a general strike about the cost of living. But it wasn't just the cost of living. It was about every single thing on the sort of trade union table was squashed into this protest, and it didn't really yeah. go anywhere because it had no focus. But yeah, the, yeah, but you know, that that the the ETOLs issue was one that you could find extraordinary um, a, a widespread agreement on. Um, I mean, even the, the the Catholic bishops' conference, you know, called for a uh, 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 for a boycott. Some someone actually within within that orbit said to me that you know, I think there was a court case. He said after the court said that actually this is this is legitimate. He disagreed with the church's stand on this because they didn't seem to have a legal leg anymore. Um, and if you're saying, well, you know, don't don't obey this law, then what's his what you know what's your message on don't don't obey others? You know, uh, but yeah, um, and it was one thing where people could boycott by just not paying. Um, it's also why you wouldn't be you wouldn't be able to roll this out with us. You know, there's been talk of a tax boycott. Well, yeah, you know, how many companies are not going to are not going to pay over the PAYE? You you would need that whole system to function, and it's just not going to. I just, oh, I just don't see it being able to. Mm, I think it also speaks, yeah, like you say, to the limits of what can be accomplished by. And tax look, just on on, on 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 the other thing on on, on the refund. I think that uh, the fact that they couldn't get the money in says something about the capacity to pay the money back. So forget it. Not going to happen. <laughs> yes. 
<laughs> and I suspect Tito Mbueni is just grumpy uh, that uh, he I, he went to bat for this the system for his during his time as finance minister, and now as soon as he's gone, it looks like they they might be pulling the plug on it. Um, hmm, interesting stuff. Okay, uh, I think we got time to just rush through two stories very quick. So, Marius, I'm going to go with you. Um, we talked a little bit about the Israeli election yesterday and how it was very um, hotly contested. It looks like, however, Benjamin Netanyahu is going to return as Prime Minister of Israel um, uh, with a coalition of four parties, which is going to take 67 seats of the 120 in the Israeli parliament. Uh, I, I think this is the fifth election in 44 months. And this is if this coalition holds, which knowing Israeli politics, it may very well not. Uh, this will be one of the most sort of solid coalitions for a while um, in Israeli politics. Uh, Morris, what do you make of their election? Yeah, 67 seats is a pretty decent majority. I think the coalition that overthrew Netanyahu, uh, I think the election was last year, uh, only had 61 seats in 120 seat Knesset. So, but just uh, as an aside, this is also, uh, people want to see what South African politics is going to look like in about 10 years' time. They, would do, uh, they wouldn't do badly if they look at Israel. Because when, uh, as the ANC carries on losing power, we, we, we can get to a point where the biggest uh, single party in parliament is only getting 25 or 30 percent in the vote. And we're going to have as fractured politics as the Israelis. And <laughs> they also, I mean, the, the coalition that took out Netanyahu last year, there's also a cautionary tale there for South African opposition politics. That, that coalition was made up of very, a lot of disparate interests. And the only point of the whole coalition was to get rid of Netanyahu. Once they got rid of that, because that party was made up, I mean, that coalition was made up of liberals, of uh, right-wing nationalists, of left-wing Arabs and so on. They managed to get rid of Netanyahu, but then what now? You know, they, they didn't really have any other reason for existing the coalition. And uh, yeah, the- And that, when, when that got, coalition deal was so complicated that it resulted exactly. in, I think a, a party that was like the fourth biggest or, or fifth biggest in the parliament getting the prime ministership first yeah. and then having so, to swap it out with someone else. Exactly. A guy called Naftali Bennett, his party got 6% of the votes, I think. He was Prime Minister for a while. So, yeah, that's uh, that's something I think South African opposition parties need to be careful of. There's obviously the aim of getting rid of the ANC. There needs to be something uh, bigger holding uh, opposition parties together than just getting rid of the ANC. There needs to be some kind of ideological thread or some other kind of reason why the parties work together. You know, So just getting rid of the ANC is actually not reason enough for parties to hold together once the ANC does get voted out, which is... Are they going to be 2024 or most probably 2029? All right. And very briefly for our last story here, Terence, this is something that caught your eye. Um, we've talked a bit on the show at, for a while now about uh, the, the kind of importation of American critical race ideas into particularly South Africa's private schools and how this uh, we think that this has had a pretty negative impact on, on relations between students and staff and, and the education of, of kids in general. Um, it looks like, uh, and there's been numerous stories in the media about uh, the drama that this has caused at some schools. Well, it looks like we've had a recent um, example of this at Fishhook High School, where uh, some early uh, reporting, um, we're still kind of trying to work out all of the details, claimed that there was a diversity, uh, what has been described as a struggle session that left pupils traumatized and is uh, resulted in the school considering bringing in counselors to help pupils deal, deal with the impact of this uh, diversity session that went awry. I wonder what happened there. Uh, Terence, what are your thoughts? Look, um, as I say, the, the information we have is still sketchy and has, we, we haven't been able to, to, to verify everything entirely, but it seems that uh, there was, there was, and this is not, this is not a private school. This is a God variety public school. Um, it seems that there was, there was an allegation of racist treatment. The Western Cape Education Department sent in you know the diversity consultants they had this the session from which uh, uh, teachers were excluded and apparently um it was uh you know fairly uh let, let me say uncompromising stuff about uh, you know who is capable of being racist and who is not anyway some students were apparently quite uh, quite upset and wanted to leave and are allegedly prevented from doing so and uh, now the school has put out a, um, uh, a letter to the parents and said, we're very sorry, well, we're investigating what happened. But, you know, this isn't so much just American um, uh, ideas on race. This seems to have a strong, you know, ZANU-PF or Pol Potter character to it. 
uh, you know, consciousness raising struggle session. It's it, it, this. This is not good. Um, you know, I I I do not uh, belittle the um, uh, you know efforts to efforts to deal with racism, whether it's real, with re real or imagined. But uh, you know, conducting conducting what seems uh, what seems like a um, uh, like an exercise in 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 ideological dictation. Is not something that that, that that we should have under any guise in a constitutional democracy. You know, like I mean, I've said I've said this before. There's some things we don't do. You don't drive drunk. You don't pee on your on your flatmate's computer, and you don't conduct a struggle session. You know, these things are bad. No, well said. Okay, uh, that is all the time we have for today. So thank you very much for listening. We uh, hope that you found the show interesting, and we will be back tomorrow on the Daily French Show.